think the best thing, I mean, that's my suggestion is uh, maybe we should just move around looking at uh, our experiences of stories that we know of, either we're involved with or we know of, we've documented, we've visited, etc. Uh, on this whole range of things, right? So, if we're talking about localization, we're talking about local democracies, we're talking about sustainability, equity, etc. No, 11. 11 and 6. Um, yeah, so any, any, any of these initiatives which actually challenge the current dominant economic and political system which is causing all the kinds of problems that we all have and we are all anguished about. Uh, and part of that, as I said, slow food is a very important part uh, from various parts of the world. So we can really talk about that. Uh, I shared one in the morning. One of the stories that's really inspired me in the last 20-25 uh, years is a very small tiny village in central India. Some of you will know it. It's called Medha Lekha. Uh, it's an indigenous uh, tribal village. And they started by first resisting a big dam that was going to actually submerge their village and destroy a whole lot of the forest. There were 200 villages that, so that resisted that dam. And I think resistance is very much part of our answers because if we don't resist the destruction that's taking place, that resistance can happen through being out on the streets fighting against a dam. It could happen through everyday activities like photocopying a copyrighted book so that everybody has access to it, right? So resistance can happen in very different ways. But they started with that and then they realized that it's not enough to resist an external threat. There are also internal issues in the village. There are some people cutting down the forest for timber, there are others, there are issues of women not being able to participate in decision making. So they actually formed a village assembly which included everybody including the children and said all decisions will be taken by consensus by everybody. No headman will take a decision, no government officer will take a decision, but the entire village assembly. And it's a very long story, I'm not going to go through all of it. But from that time to now, if you look at that village today, it has taken legal control over 2,000 hectares of its forest, reversing 200 years of colonial history. It has just completely remarkably, just a few months back, all the agriculture, private agricultural land of its of the village has been turned over into the commons of the village. It's probably the first village in India to do that. So that all the land is part of the commons now. There's no private land in that village anymore. It has kicked out a, and I'm sorry to use those words, uh, if they appear to be violent, but it has kicked out a paper mill that was coming in destroying its bamboo forest and now they do their own sustainable bamboo harvesting through which they are earning the revenues which are being put into complete energy security, complete livelihood security, complete water security, training of young people in new jobs, etc. Now, to my mind, and all of this is done through one single slogan, which I'll say and then I'll end. They say, in Bombay and Delhi, we elect the government. But in our village, we are the government. So I'll come back maybe later with more such stories. But we can maybe we'll start with you. Uh, tell us a bit about slow food, and then others can share their stories. Um, so, so slow food was actually founded in 1986 in Italy, and it was founded in in Italy for a reason. The people there have a very strong gastronomic identity and culture. The whole way Italians eat, the way they live, it's, it's very relaxed and it's very, it's very thought about. So people don't just eat for the sake of filling their stomach. It's, it's about pleasure and uh, experiencing well-being through, through food. So when the, the movement was, was started by only five people, were actually against the McDonald's that was to be set up in Rome, and they threw artisanally made pasta on the on the windows on the windows of the McDonald's, and McDonald's was not set up in that area. So this is where it started, more from a from a consumer's perspective, and not liking the way our, our food system is being changed. Um, but throughout its, its evolvement, it has also taken into consideration the side of a producer. That, you know, how, how are we to, to um, eat good food if we don't respect and we don't honor the people that are on the ground and that, that use our resources respectfully? And out of this link between producer and consumer, the three principles of slow food have emerged, which are good, clean, and fair. 
So good meaning we want food to be tasty. We want it to be um, culturally related. And because it's culturally related, it's tasty. Because all people in their own areas, they have mastered to make the best food. In the south, you, you, they know how to use coconuts. They're coastal people. In, in my place, we, it's very cold, but we grow a variety of potatoes, and we have, my grandmother has so many, a myriad of recipes, <coughs> and nobody else in the world can replicate it, and this is why it's tasty, so this is good. And then clean means that it's free from chemicals and, and um, free of pesticides, and, and also good for the animal health, that we respect animals and the bees. And fair meaning that it's fair to the producer, accessible prices, but also accessible prices to the, to the consumer. So these are the three sort of uh, principles of slow food. But there's another word that they coined, which is the co-producer, which means by us deciding and choosing what we want to eat, we make a decision in the food system. And, and um, I think it was uh, Michael Pollan who said um, eating is, is not only an agricultural act, but it's a political act. By me deciding to, to support my local farmer, I can change the, you know, I can influence the system. And out of, so slow food, but slow food has these principles, but it doesn't really tell people what to do. It looks at examples around the world and, 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 and tells stories. Basically, slow food is a movement that tells stories from around the world. And, um, and what they want to do is include even the most marginalized, even people in isolated villages and look at how, how have, have their traditions emerged. And, and um, I think what, what makes slow food attractive for many people around the world it is that, that it, it doesn't try to be stagnant and to, to hold on to something that is not evolving, but it is looking how we can network. Different people across the world can share their experiences and maybe also revive traditions that are, that are lost and that are forgotten. And uh, to give you an example, for example, uh, you know in India, millet. Millet is it, something that is slowly getting lost and people are losing interest. But you saw today the beautiful biscuits that we all eat. And I think that is the result of interaction of different cultures, different cultures who know about millet and adding to it, giving it little twists here and there. And, and these ideas have happened in lots of places in India, and today we can see a revival, a movement. We can see a millet network that stretches across, across communities and across, um, across countries, actually. So I think the whole idea of, of bringing local stories to an international community and taking it back to our respective communities. So that is, in principle, the idea of slow food. I'm Madhu, Madhu Reddy from Hyderabad. Um, I have a background in hotel management, so food was a big part of my life. And as I went into the farming side, I um, actually realized that, again, it's the producer and the consumer, the relationship between them. So on Terra Madri Day, on Slow Food Movement Day this past year, so I uh, went back and connected with the alumni in Hyderabad, which is the hotel management school. And uh, we went and proposed to the principal there uh, on how about actually doing something in the college. She was very receptive. And we actually, uh, with the help of the chefs, the student chefs and the chefs who are teachers there, they designed a whole menu which was seasonal, which was local, which was millet based, which was foods which were, um, uh, you know, uh, disappearing uh, from so something like country chicken, for example, when you said animal health, you know, it comes back to that. Um, the students cooked the food and they served themselves and the guests. And then we actually had an interactive session where we talked about foods uh, in different parts of India which are disappearing and why they are disappearing. And uh, it, was, it, it, it was just an exchange of information, an effort made by me and another friend and the principal who kind of, you know, it was only because I, there was some connection. So I think finding that connection, even in our, it could be just hosting it for you know, perhaps a group of friends or family or relatives, something like that. And it was, I felt, and the, the college was so um, uh, into it. They prepared banners, the students actually did some research, 
and uh, when we were talking about different foods they actually raised their hands they knew the questions or they are asking questions so i think to some extent go back and tap those student chefs like india still doesn't have you know the the jamie olivers of the world who are talking about slow food movement i mean our chefs slowly are but i felt that might be one area where the restaurants do actually come out you know the alice waters of california and stuff like that so perhaps you know if, if we have any connections with schools or is to go back and make them cook and design the menu and um, why is that you don't eat cauliflower in summer it can be grown today with all the technology so asking those questions from a producer standpoint and also a consumer cabbage and cauliflower why shouldn't we eat or what happened to the mahua tree uh, in uh, in jharkhand and you know tribal areas of odisha <coughs> because again the forest rights have been taken so connecting them with again the global issue of globalization which has brought in the change the pds system and the millet it was very it was a very humbling experience to actually go back and you know do that with them so uh, we actually put it on the website as well i i was associated more to the slow food movement because they have a university and i i studied and worked there for 3 years but and now what we are doing is like we are applying it in the north east one thing that the slow food movement very often gets criticized about is that it's an elitist movement because uh, this whole idea of tasty food the pleasure of taste is a leader thing for Jamie Oliver and we are trying now to to reverse that and to say that the use of our senses is something that especially the marginalized have mastered to give you also an example recently we had a, we had a blind sculptor and uh, i met him by coincidence in shillong and and he told me you're working with food and slow food i'm very interested in that because me as someone who doesn't see my my senses i challenge you we do it sensory game and my my senses are much better and we actually we do this game of of um, feeling um, traditional crops without seeing them so we have the different millets for example the the, the uh, finger millet and the foxtail millet and the children don't recognize they don't know and he knew he immediately knew he touched and he said yeah i know exactly the difference between this foxtail millet and another one because i when i go into the field or when i am with my food i feel it i touch it because i can't see so i see i i can't see with my eyes but i see with my hands so so one thing i think the slow food movement really has to learn more is to be more inclusive because we are risking to say that good food is something of the elite and that would would again bring it to the whole uh, issues of globalization not necessarily label it as slow food because i mean one thing that sometimes happens is there's nothing wrong with the label but because it's come from outside there's a reaction saying oh, why are we following yeah, absolutely uh, and of course also the fact that there are similar traditions in india for a very or sorry in this part of the world for a very very long time so what's also happening in number of places are people are doing uh, you know food festivals uh, melas where they are bringing back their traditional recipes and, and things like that some of them are like mobile festivals every year in andhra pradesh in zahirabad where they do like every year for a month they do a festival a biodiversity festival in which a lot of the local recipes are brought back in recently in chatisgarh and odisha they had tribal food festivals where a lot of the old things which were getting lost otherwise were brought back in uh, so there's much of that also happening i think and of course it's all part of the same philosophy the same principles um, and i think india has a big role to play if this movement is to grow and make it a, a difference because for us in the north east we we've, we've merged the slow food movement with the indigenous partnership which i'm actually also representing the indigenous pl- partnership is a platform to bring traditional knowledge and science into dialogue rather than separating the two giving them equal um, respect <coughs> and and out of that i think really the north is making is making a, a significant contribution to the movement like you say festivals we're calling it the meram o meram o is the kasi ver- version for mother earth and and people now in the villages they they put up the banners from the event and they start making uh, like seed exchange based on the meram o principle so so it has to be something 
that, that can be accessible for everyone. And I think for, for India, they say there is so much potential and so much opportunities with all the creativity. I mean, if I see the people here, everyone has got so many creative ideas. So I'm a part of an organization called Initiatives of Change. And um, basically, so the, the, the tenet of all the work that we do is, is Gandhiji's principle of be the change you want the world to be. Instead of pointing fingers at you should do this and they should do that, change begins with you. So um, we had last year uh, one of the IS officers who had come for a workshop and he got very inspired and he wanted to do. Now he's from Sikandrabad but he's posted in Shillong in the northeast. And that man's passion and dream for that whole thing. Uh, so we ran a three month long initiative then and now it follows up on self-governance. Um, and 630 gram sevaks because they are at the grassroots level, they work in the villages, you know, um, went through this whole thing and the idea is self-governance, that's what it is. So instead of somebody else telling you what to do, you being able to, from your silence, being able to assert and what's right and what needs to be done. So then that answers all these things, so corruption and uh, they have a lot of alcohol issues, you know, and abuse then related to alcoholism. So that's one thing which has gotten, and now we are keeping in track, so it's changing. The other, indirectly how it affected, so the Garos and the Khasis, these two sort of large communities, pretty much are at war in some sense. Uh, but at least with these 630 and the villages that they uh, hold, each one of them takes care of three to four villages. They have started looking inwards and looking at partnering and partnerships. You know, so when they, they so the simple invitation because they're very simple people. You know, very, and I love their names. They have names like Shining Star. <laughs> You know, and uh, 16. Welcome champion. Welcome champion. These are names, real names of people. Welcome champion. Welcome champion. Shooting star. You actually have names like that. And it's such a warm. <laughs> and somehow inherently there is joy in their being. You know. Uh, so so they, so these things have started to uh, melt in some sense. You know these. Um, and I think more such inward looking dialogue enabling self governed initiatives is path really. Patshala is a little school which is attempting to uh, take the processes of education that we have inherited and that we have worked with in the 20th century one step ahead in some explorations. <coughs> Um, one is that uh, we realized very early that the land speaks a language and we have to listen to that language very carefully. Uh, Patshala is situated on the flood plain of the river Parar and we were advised quite counterintuitively not to plant too many trees. So it's very beautiful grassy land with lots of varieties of grass, lots of sun as you can imagine in Tamil Nadu and uh, paradoxically enormous quantity of water at 20 feet depth. The land has a very gentle slope moving away uh, from uh, west to east and this means that uh, during the very heavy rains land would stay on the water would stay on the land for long periods of time soil has become clay over many many years and this land which was extremely difficult land difficult set of combination was on the abandoned fringe of five villages it was also difficult because the family that owned the land did not want to uh, were, were very mistrustful of each other they were having terrible fights and they decided to sell it to the school because they thought they won't cheat one against the others and we bought this piece of land and everybody liked it who saw it but then what to do with it and a school had to start after some time because the laws demand that there must be school we were actually postponing it in the meantime the conversation started with teachers large length of conversation over almost six seven years about what should the school be like if you're going to start a school are we going to replicate whatever has been going on or are we going to change something and what are some things we change so like slow cooking and slow thinking this went on for about six years and we decided that because there is no power for 12 to 16 hours that the architecture must reflect passive cooling, passive solar cooling. So we stumbled upon the Vardha tumbler hollow 
tumbler roofing, which can keep the building cool even if there is no power. Then we decided that we will have large windows and do away with window frames and window shutters. Nobody shuts the windows in Tamil Nadu. At least I have never done it while I was living in the school's campus for almost 20 years. So we said no, it's of no use mosquito mesh because this was the time of chicken gunya, malaria, everything. Um, and uh, the school came up. We changed the class. We have, they are designing a school with, from grade 5 to grade 10, only multiple age classrooms. Junior school and middle school and senior school, uh, middle school and senior school, grade 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we have only four what we call learning spaces. We don't even call them classrooms. And we have a completely different set of organizing principles where there's a lot of room for dialogue among students. We don't have teachers and students. We have educator learners and learner educators. All this flows very nicely from Krishnamurti's philosophy also. So we shifted that landscape a bit, shifted the architectural landscape sub substantially. Classrooms are L-shaped. It's impossible to lecture in those classrooms, <laughs> you know. So you have to really carve out spaces for lecturing, otherwise it's more difficult. Uh, so the teacher's voice is heard as a kind of a you know, voice which kind of brings something to a conversation or addresses some small issue. The teacher is a presence in the classroom, a supportive, facilitative presence rather than a lecturer. And then with water at 20 feet, we decided to go in for dry composting toilets, which is the only one we have. And it worked marvelously for us all these years. So we have a bunch of students who are now completely acclimatized, used to it. We don't have anybody to clean our bathroom. We do our bathrooms. The floor is a very important equalizing element in our education. We have low round tables everywhere. And that's what we sit around and eat. And that's what we sit around and work. And that's what is used in the dorms for studying. And we have little solar lamps now which hang over the tables. So whether there's pop, we have not had a day without light. Despite the biggest cyclones and the biggest power cuts and everything. And uh, so the solar, uh, the dry composting toilets also we ran into problems. Because the man who was manufacturing these bowls in Ahmedabad, he stopped uh, manufacturing them because there was no demand for it. So we had to literally invent our own, design our own dry composting toilets with the help of students, teachers and everybody. So we have beautiful 21st century stainless steel urine diversion dry composting toilets. You can see it on our website. There are fantastic stuff, really. And it's working very well. The students are quite proud of it. And they introduce uh, visitors to it. So taking care of our waste is a very important thing and completing that cycle. We also <coughs> grow organic rice. That's the only kind of rice we have grown on the campus. We recently started growing some vegetables also. And uh, we have done some workshops with farmers. They come and teach us and we learn from them. I think um, adding value to the fact that some people practice organic farming itself is something that's good for the atmosphere of the villages. Most people have given up. Most people just don't do it. So um, uh, we are known as a school which has only organic rice. So I think uh, the people in the villages and everybody around values that and the students and the parents also value that. The rice tastes quite different and wonderful it is. Now we are growing millets as well. We are starting some work in that direction. Uh, the school was designed right from the beginning that it should make sense to the neighboring communities. That's one of the reasons why it's floor based. We have a good outreach program. We have an outdoor science lab which is used by the children in the neighborhood villages. We have evolved a program for them. We also have a program for supporting children with disabilities. And out of the blue, something new has happened, that the Department of Science and Technology and four IITs, they approached us and said they wanted to put up a solar power generation unit on our campus. And uh, this is coming up now. Yesterday was the day when we saw steam coming out of this unit. Can you imagine sunlight tube at some 20 feet height? Then you have high steam coming out in a big way. Yesterday they came and tested it out. They are going to generate steam at 450 degrees centigrade, superheated steam, drive a turbine, store the heat in molten salt. And if this works, decentralized power generation model for the others in and around. But the exciting thing was that we keep asking, we keep asking ourselves and kept asking, why did you come to us? They said, you seem to be committed to renewable energy, so you will protect this. 
so we have a big gift from the Department of Science and Technology and others. And this is how the school is evolving and moving. And uh, we are thinking that there is space for osmotic learners. The 11 and 12 program will not be teaching based, but will be support and guidance based. And there are lots of people who, we have space for energy, we have space for people who want to come and do new things. I believe we are a voice of hope as far as school education is concerned. Uh, but just mention a little bit about the multi-age classroom and the processes because there is a significance here. This has found great value in Tamil Nadu. In fact, it shifted the landscape of education in Tamil Nadu in one swift year. Then we started having our classes where children would read, they would underline, they would discuss with each other. There was very little that the teacher had to do if you had simple material. Now, I don't believe 21st century belongs to content. It belongs to process, how you digest information, how you understand. How you share, how you listen to multiple perspectives. This is what the 21st century, and we have to build this into school. But this was found so good that it went to 16,500 schools, 50,000 classrooms in one year. And we saw it being practiced in all the villages, and the children drawing mind maps. Color has come into the classroom, you know, not just blue and black and red and something. And so uh, this is the model which we are adopting. We believe that it's possible to have a process of education which works in the village and in a private school and in the city. It doesn't matter. We are human beings and the fundamental processes are the same. So I do believe we represent something in the area of change here and hopefully something will come out of this. My name is Amit. I work with this uh, small place called Centre for Learning in uh, Sikandrabad. Uh, and since childhood I was inspired by uh, Ravindranath Tagore's idea and his, his initiative of Shanti Niketan and so for about two years I went around seeing you know what are such places existing around and then came to this place Centre for Learning and uh, it was started in 1982 by the lady called Gurvi. I met her and then since last two and a half years I've been working with her. It's, it's, uh, in, in, our, in my village near Meerut, I had seen, uh, last year I had gone and I had seen that there was a person who could not speak, uh, who was both deaf and dumb, and, but what had happened around him, the place where he stayed, everybody had learned how to speak. Nobody was taught, but he was just the part of that community. And my my uncles who were living just nearby, they all knew how the sign language and speak. So I asked them, were you taught, you know, how did you learn? They said that we were living with him, we had to learn. I mean, he's part of it. Which struck me how, you know, wonderfully he was integrated. There weren't any special places for segments. And so the point I was telling is that is something uh, I have started to feel in, in this place here. We have very less number of children, just 14 right now. That's because this year we decided not to go for any recognition uh, and just exist as a community learning center rather, rather than a school because it would bring certain things which we were not comfortable with. But that has brought the number down, but because the number actually went down for 14 children, uh, I saw it becoming more like a, like a community where parents were as involved and, and the difference between parents, children and teachers as learners started to fade away and melt a bit. And, and, and a child who was not, one, one child comes to us and uh, uh, he wasn't going to school for the last two, three years because no school would accept him because of certain characteristics he was displaying. And, how he also becomes a part of family and the rest of the children, the 12, 13 children who are there, how wonderfully they take care of this child who was actually thrown out of two or three schools because he was not fitting in. He has become part of the family and they, in fact, we were not able to, you know, identify what is this child really good at. And it was one of the child, one of the child who was mentoring this child who was able to figure out and then talk to us and tell that, why are you giving him this kind of work? Why don't you give him, you know, this work? He, he really excels in that. He was doing that when he came to our home uh, last evening. So that, that kind of a nice hope, hopeful thing I see that where uh, even children are put out in different places and it seems to bring in and build a smaller community around children. This is also again another uh, experiment in education.
माय आय एम संजीव कुलकर्णी आय कम फ्रॉम दिस प्लेस कॉल धारवाड विच इज अबाउट फोर हंड्रेड किलोमीटर्स नॉर्थ ऑफ बैंगलोर वी स्टार्टेड अ स्कूल कॉल्ड बाल बड़गा बाल बड़गा इन कनाडा मीन्स अ परिवार ऑफ चिल्ड्रन इट स्टार्टेड एज अ नर्सरी फॉर थ्री इयर ओल्ड किड्स विथ जस्ट थ्री चिल्ड्रन इन द फ्रंट रूम ऑफ अ हाउस इन नाइनटीन नाइंटी सिक्स स्मॉल रूम जस्ट ट्वेल्व बाई ट्वेल्व एंड वी डेंट हैव एनी प्लान्स एनी ब्लू प्रिंट और एनीथिंग लग दैट बट इयर ऑन इयर वी वेंट ऑन एडिंग अ क्लास एंड नाउ वी हैव कम अप टू टेंथ स्टैंडर्ड ऑलरेडी फाइव बैचेस ऑफ टेंथ स्टैंडर्ड चिल्ड्रन हैव पास आउट There is no uniform in the school, no compulsory prayer, prayers every day, no bakery food allowed in the school, no bakery, no bakery at items allowed in the school. Every day children have to bring some raw food, fruits or sprouts or whatever. Children don't address their teachers as uh, madam or sir or anything. Instead, they address them as Maushi, Mama, Akka, and Anna. And for the first 12 years, we had the school in a very small compound, a house. And then uh, we we searched and got another place, just adjacent to the university. Now now we have three and a half acres of land, which is which is a slope like this. It's one side of the valley. There uh, we have constructed, uh, we have made a campus. with uh, child friendly and as much as possible in eco friendly features making use of the topography of the land as it is with lots and lots of trees children themselves have planted something like 2 and 1/2 thousand saplings and made a mini forest uh, and uh, we constructed the buildings with hand pressed mud blocks parents got involved children themselves made the bricks so as he was telling large windows no closing of the windows or doors it's all open uh, so it's it's a kind of a middle path we have not gone to one extreme and become a, become an island we now have 320 children and uh, it's a kannada medium school to start a private kannada medium school in a city like darwad is Uh, nowadays nobody there is there are no takers for kannada medium but we have a very deep conviction that education has to be in one's mother tongue or in the language of the community but parents have uh, supported us in a very big way no compulsory donation for admission almost 25% of the children avail either partial or full fee concession because of their socio economic backgrounds uh, a totally secular background and uh, we yeah, are just day before yesterday uh, out of the 432 schools which participated in the eco friendly school campaign for the district of darwad our school got the first prize well i think both of them talked about this blurring of lines between you know learners teachers and things like that that's what uh, so i belong to a group so we uh, collectively run a non profit organic shop in chennai and uh, so we are my name is dikal and the shop is called um, and you know, we've been working quite a lot in uh, you know introducing millets into the uh, chennai i think and uh, and what you know and it, what's really uh, you know i wanted to bring today was uh, this blurring of lines so you know that uh, now the shop has reached a stage where uh, people are not considering themselves consumers and not everybody i'm sure there are many people who do but uh, many times farmers who bring something uh, to the shop you know uh, stay back there and they buy something else from the shop and uh, people who come as as customers a cross over into the other side unload our truck uh, and <laughs> put everything there and explain to other newcomers you know what is going on and uh, the people who are uh, typically you know serving or uh, you know working you know and who are usually you know given orders like do this do that uh, now you know gotten so much of uh, themselves uh, 
into it, uh, into the subject of organic food, that the uh, person who used to you know, drive a, a van for us, uh, you know, three times a week to pick up certain things, uh, has now started doing uh, farm visits. You know. uh, he will go to Sirvanamalai and uh, you know, visit a couple of farms and call me and say, you know, Akka, I saw this, this farm, he has this. Uh, you know, I like it. We can start getting it from him. <laughs> and, you know, and they've started eating uh, uh, more organic food and traditional foods in their homes. Uh, so, you know, that I think that one of those modern tendency to kind of uh, bracket ourselves into producers, consumers, shopkeepers. And now there are a few more urban farmers coming in into the shop. And we haven't yet started selling produce from urban farmers, but probably they'll start, you know, exchanging it or giving it to... Uh, in organizations and things like that. It would be really nice to see some of the small farmers from whom we are sourcing millets and you know, things like that consume more of it than that. Uh, I know that you know, uh, Timbuktu and DDS, uh, you know, these are areas where uh, that's been really uh, worked on about people not selling, uh, growing something for sale to the elite, uh, which they are not consuming themselves. But this is something that just a producer who then goes and buys ration rice for 1 rupee, 2 rupees. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, to, um, to capture these things from the grassroots, like systems like this, because I think it's fairly easy to be in a town and, and to get the attention of people from the advertisement of health and it's all hip to, you know, eat health. But how, how can we make it something that starts from the grassroots where asking about communities who are growing food, traditional foods, who might have their own cafes, you know, where they are sharing. Yeah, we have our own kitchen and that's mainly, mainly for us. Uh, my name is Pablo from Timbuktu Collective. Uh, we have a kitchen, I mean we have many kitchens, but the main one in near, near the office is supplies food to and two people who come to the cooperative. So, well, yeah, we, 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 we have tried to create a space which is different. A space where there is a sense of aesthetics, where cooked food is cooked nicely. Uh, it is not, it's not uh, hygienic. And things like that. One of the things that we have started doing is doing food demos in the villages, and we try to make those also a little hygiene in the condition, those conditions. Because here we have created a condition, but there those conditions are. But I'm, I don't know this, this business of hygiene, non hygiene, I am very confused about it. You know, I really don't know what is hygienic and what is not hygienic. I'm confused. I'm not saying, I, I cannot understand what is right and wrong. Because I, I am questioning the whole, whole, whole basis of bacteria. <laughs> so, so I, I don't know how to... But that's what we are trying in Timbuktu. How is the response of the communities? What what they uh, feel about in, uh, improving hygiene and aesthetic value of their dishes of their food? Do they think it's important? Like they see, uh, I think the food as it is cooked in the homes is. 
It is in the public spaces that things have gone crazy. And I think one of the things is plastic. One of the reasons is plastic. The other is water. And it's not just that. It is the availability of these things, the privatization of these things, which were earlier, you know, the the, the path of cooking vessels have changed. And with it, the need for water has changed. And uh, the, 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 the waste, use of the waste, so-called waste, has changed. Because earlier it was given to the, the cows, to the sheep, you know, people would come and collect it. The hen, the people from the homes would come to a, a local restaurant, if you call it that, and, and take the waste away. But now nobody is taking the waste away. Because lesser and lesser people are growing things. And the waste, what is what the, the kitchen waste, or the, is not going away. So hygiene is a much, much larger thing. I don't think that it is people who are wanting to live like who are wanting to do it like so um, my confusion comes from it. It's the public space versus the private space. And there's a confusion in the in, in our world. I think even in the public spaces now, you said partly I think you've heard about plastics and so on. So for instance, weddings, where food is served. Traditionally, I can't believe that that would have been unhygienic, that there would have been waste lying around, etc. Today, you go even to so-called remote places and there's a wedding. Next to the Shamiya, the tent, there's all this plastic waste. So it's those things which are created. And when you transfer that into a town situation, an urban situation, it's even worse. It's worse because there's absolutely no space. There's nothing which can actually deal with it. And the water you're getting is already But otherwise, I mean, another example, of course, is uh, very close to the Second Development Society also runs an organic restaurant in Zahirabad, where only locally grown pellets are picked and locally, local recipes are the ones that are served. It runs reasonably well. It's in a town, but so it's a means of actually one providing some revenues which farmers can have. Secondly, popularizing what otherwise is getting lost, traditional recipes and things like that. Uh, but in their own communities, of course, they are doing what Babu is talking about. So it's a traditional kind of thing. In fact, in Hyderabad, there is this place called Dialogue in Dhaku. Which we are also behind. We will be happy. <laughs> 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 Modern technology. It's, it's a <laughs> dialogue in darkness. It's a restaurant uh, run by blind people. People who serve are blind everything. So when you enter it, you know, they orient you. And then the way it is designed, you, they take away your watch and mobile, anything which limit any kind of life. And when you enter, and you have the whole meal, one hour of eating experience in absolute darkness. And and if you're served, and these people, they serve, you don't know that. But when they lead you out and you turn back, that's when you realize. And it is an experience. When you're talking about senses and food and uh, a certain appreciation of what it means to be like that, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's an experience one must have. Uh, when I attended a similar such gathering, in Chennai recently there was an expert who, who talked about the the oncoming tsunami of shit that we're going to get submerged in because of this that how uh, the, the centralization of this fundamental cycle of human life is, is creating so many problems and he talked about how um, at an individual level you wouldn't think that okay something like this what you flush on the toilet creates a problem but at some point of the line it mixes in with your um, shampoo chemicals from the drain it mixes in with the other chemicals that you use otherwise it mixes in, it mixes in with the effluence of the factories 
and that then mixture prevents our natural waste from decomposing in the natural way that is supposed to. Mm -hmm. And then the concoction that you get is the problem. And so, and then we also talk about how actually our, so our waste at the original point were actually not really that bad at all. Yeah. And I also had this experience that when I had gone to Auroville, yeah. <laughs> 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 when I had <laughs> gone to a farm, I had spent some time there, I cleaned out a human ear toilet, means a dry compost toilet. So after after about six months, uh, yeah, yeah I sank exactly. my hands into it, it's complete soil, there's nothing yeah, is absolutely soil. So it's, it's actually something... The thing is, it's not allowed in your uh, yeah. uh, uh, organic uh, whatever uh, farming. That's what you need to talk to God about. It's been through. So I'd like to know what is, I mean, if yeah, you know something more about it. Yeah, the standard of operating procedures, something, something it says, if you use that, you, it's part of the certification, so, you know. So, don't get certified. No, no, I'm just saying, I'm just, I mean, I don't know. No, that's I think you're sitting in the paddy field. Yeah, 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 yeah that's one of the best things that you can do. Yeah. 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 And then you're sitting in the drains, you know, in, so that the pigs come and eat it. Yeah. It's the best thing that the you can do. Uh, the corn, the yeah, and, 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 and we we've, we've done it floor. always. I mean, I did it. No, I think all the houses are built on sticks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's just the shit hole is just a hole. Yeah, yeah. Below are all the pigs. Big Go up. Anyway, go so, over the yeah. I just want to point out that somehow we are going back to food all the time. <laughs> what shit is also food. <laughs> Even with the economic the happiness movement, they found that food is a very central thing around it which is, a lot of things revolve. Of course. But I also want to bring water. Yeah. Maybe a few examples of water because that's also for study. I'll, I'll just finish that point. Uh, in the last two months, I am trying some, some other model of uh, uh, eco-friendly toilet. Like the shit goes into a tank wherein there is already cow dung and all the other biomass and there are earthworms. So it, it becomes an earthworm pit also. It's very fast. Ha, it's very, very fast, fast, very fast. Very fast. It. Many people are familiar with stories of water harvesting in villages. So I won't. But one that I was really impressed by was in an urban area because that's more, much more challenging. Where in Bhuj, a uh, number of organizations have actually got together and convinced the administration also to make uh, Bhuj as far as possible water self-sufficient as a urban area. Now you can understand, uh, I mean, imagine Bhuj as India's lowest rainfall or second lowest rainfall. Bhuj is the lowest rainfall area in India, 250 millimeters of rainfall. It's virtually nothing. There are some years in which there's only one day of rain. Uh, they have traditionally 40 reservoirs in and around which from long back, which fall, fell into disuse because governments had built, managed, etc., etc. Now the communities are actually bringing those back, they're repairing them, they're bringing back all the wells that are there or making new ones. And already four of the so-called slum colonies are now completely water self-sufficient. Uh, they, they don't even rely on municipal water at all, only rainfall. Uh, they make sure that every drop is being is going into either the reservoir or the well. It's managed through a water management committee, so every family provides five rupees a, a month. And can you imagine these are families which have which are amongst the poorest, mostly Dalits. Um, and uh, for the last three or four years, many of them have been 100% water sensitive. And so what they're trying to do is now then the same colonies they're also trying to deal with waste. So one of the things they're doing is all the wet waste gets picked up by people who deliver milk. So the people who got cows, maybe just outside which actually come and pick up all the wet waste, take it away, it's fed to their cows and the colony gets rid of its wet waste. They're trying to now figure out ways to start uh, reducing and then recycling the non-wet I mean the so dry waste, right? but that's going to take a little bit, a little bit of time. Uh, the other thing very interesting they have done is to use as far as possible local, local or localizable materials for housing, again for the poor. So, and this is not charity, these are not humans, but the, the people make the houses, uh, help make the houses themselves and then over a process of time they get ownership. 
from over the house. This is also an area where 15 or 14 or 15 years back was this devastating earthquake, right? So a lot of people actually lost their houses, lost their livelihoods, etc. So it's an attempt to actually rebuild lives in ways that are far more sustainable and locally controllable. Not dependent on outside. And but the other really very very interesting thing they're doing is they've set up a thing called Urban Setu. Setu is bridge. So it's a place, it's an office basically where three or four people are sitting. If anybody from the town can actually come in and ask for what are as a let's say a woman here or as a slum dweller, what are my rights? What are the schemes which I'm supposed to be entitled to, which nobody ever tells me about? Uh, how do I, I? I'm not literate. I don't know how to fill a form. How do I actually apply for that particular scheme? What are my rights under the constitution as an urban citizen, right? Urban whatever. And so it's actually just empowering people. And they've already done this with about four or five thousand residents. Empowering people to be far more uh, both rights based and responsible citizens of the city and forcing then the government to be that much more accountable. So, I mean, it started with water, but it's now going into all, all sorts of things. Any particular section, place in Buj? Uh, any, uh, any particular place in Buj or Buj town? Bush town is a whole, but these colonies are, I mean, there are four particular colonies where the water and the waste, and there are some other colonies where the waste work is happening, middle class colonies where the waste work is happening, other colonies where the housing stuff is happening, uh, across the whole city and actually many other parts of Kutch. Uh, so who's, who is organizing this or who is inspiring this? There are six civil society organizations. Hmm. There is something How called is? Kutch Nav Nirman Abhyan which started after the earthquake. And that kind of then uh, split itself into several different civil society groups. So Gunnar Shala is the one that does mm. local materials, construction, some incredible material. Bhoj can get very, very hot. But their whole office and a lot of the houses that they built for the poor, uh, no fans, no ACs. In the middle of summer, you can sit comfortably inside with the way that they've done construction. Somewhat similar to your, you know, but, but different because for Bhoj, I have different kind of materials. So that's Hunar Shala. There's a Sehjeevan which does a lot of the empowerment work, the information gathering. Uh, there's something called ACT which does the water work. So there are about five or six such civil society groups. Uh, I can send around material. So with water, what do they exactly do? Uh, the wells or is there something they didn't do earlier? Uh, well, partly a lot of it had just become disused. So one is cleaning it up, repairing it. Relining the wells, the linings are gone, the bricks are broken down, relining it. But also then a little bit of slope work so that around the reservoir of the lake you build a slope so that when it rains, whatever rain falls comes in. Do you have any very good systems? Any way to systems? Even the well has a watershed which is kept clean and by, by, by law. <laughs> No one goes there, walks there, you know, the uh, custom, the custom. custom. And it's not a big open well, it's a small so hole, so there's no, very little uh, evaporation. It's very good. Yeah. This is all over Rajasthan, the, the traditional water, yeah, yeah. I mean, here they are being used, but there's wonderful systems all over the place, which now are not being, being used. used. They're coming back, they're coming back, they're coming back. Even around in Kutch, about 100 villages have become water sections. And this is, these are the areas where the Narmada water was supposed to have come 20 years back. Still, fortunately, it has not come. If it comes, it will destroy these local things. But 100 villages in 300, 250, 300 millimeters of rainfall being water cells. It's just incredible. It completely blows away this myth that you need to build a big dam somewhere and transfer the water. But, but there are crucial gifts here. You need the social institutional mechanisms to control water use. Yeah. Because if people start growing sugar cane, yeah. no way that uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, going to be. Yeah. Or if somebody in the colony, in that slum colony, suddenly becomes just like a slum lord and says, okay, I'm going to take as much water as I want. Yeah, so yeah. the local democratic institutional dynamics is really absolutely that's the big thing. In Rajasthan and Alwar, where they've done it in this. Uh, Arvari uh, river basin, 400 square kilometers, completely water self-sufficient. 
one of their first rules, so they, so they, they set up a parliament. Mm -hmm. I think it's India's only people's parliament, where all the 65 villages are represented on that parliament. And one of the first rules the parliament made was no commercial sugarcane production. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to grow sugarcane. For personal consumption, you can grow it. Yeah. Another rule was no, I mean, basically no crops which are yeah. not under tobacco, etc. Then uh, another rule was all the catchment areas. Uh, cut down on grazing or stop grazing because they need to be regenerated so when it rains, water is slowly percolating. So there are lots of such sort of innovative This is in Arbari. This is Arbari in Rajasthan. There, there are similar things going on here Bazar in Maharashtra, in Nashik. So there are, on the web there are some fascinating uh, videos about Hivde Bazaar's story as well as Popadra Baba's talk. So one thing that they have a parliament inside the village. So everybody, every adult of the village goes there and they collectively make the decisions. But when I went there last year, I saw, the, like the scenery that I saw was amazing. It was a whole mountain range. As far as I could see, there were counter lines drug everywhere. Means along the slopes, there were at some elevations, there were these counter trenches dug so that when the rain falls, it percolates inside. It stops mm -hmm. there. And that I saw millions of them spread across an entire mountain range around the entire village. Then they have a water recycling system which is like, um, since that area goes from one part to like, it's an elevation, it's in the hills in Maharashtra. So um, the water that comes at one place goes through some lakes and through the ground down. And at, at, at the reservoir down, there is a pumping station which then pumps the water to the top. And then it goes down again. Um, the, all the villages, none of them have a, a bore well or anything like that. They don't take the water from below, they take the water from these reservoirs that they have made. So they have made man-made lakes, reservoirs, one at a higher level, one at a lower Cascade. level, one at a yeah, cascading. And, and so the water goes down through the ground and then it's pumped back. And so they keep recycling the water that way, on a very grand level. So that was a very inspiring thing that I saw. There's a local story here. Regeneration of lakes in Bangalore. Yes. I mean, I don't know much about it, but um, again, um, Bangalore. Bangalore. Yeah, the fact that Bangalore has a lot of man-made lakes and um, the idea again, uh, from what we understood when we visited, was that these lakes are commons. It is bringing back to commons uh, uh, in an urban situation, going and figuring out who the commons were. So the apartment dwellers the village close by and I think one of the uh, what I remember them talking about was the lake is not an independent body of water it is a chain of lakes because again that cascading system so you've got you know it sits the lakes or something and what uh, they figured was um, as an apartment complex, you're living next by, close by, you have as much right to it. Um, so in one of the lakes, they built the walking park. Uh, one of the lakes, they completely no access to human beings. That was only for animals and plants and regeneration of the biodiversity. Then other lakes, uh, I think one was where um, they figured um, that the local village um, used to use uh, a section of the lake to wash their buffaloes. So they said, how do we make this hygienic and, you know, in, uh, aesthetically? So they actually built platforms uh, for the buffalo washing. And in fact, the chokidar who's looking after the lake was the young man who played when the lake was dry. They, they played cricket in the lake. So bringing back people who had vested interest and in connection so uh, this is actually close by uh, on Sarjapur Road. I am one of the sort of vertical <coughs> in uh, Grameen and Pariyavaran Kendra, which is uh, you know, development. So uh, two fundamentally three initiatives that it is taken. One is this making of spring boxes, which is what you're talking about. You know, uh, so normally they would have natural spring boxes where water just collects and you take from that, but then eventually it evaporates or animals come and drink, so it's unhygienic. So there, so wherever is a natural resource, these boxes are actually made. So we got involved in doing that, identifying what is the natural route that the water takes and building these boxes and 
uh, and then from there it is connected to sort of the water well, why box? so most of box, yeah. spring box it's called a spring box so the spring water is collected in it actually it like doesn't a tank. sort of like but it doesn't so the water that gets percolated through the stones in and around that gets collected over here and it is because it's a box it's hygienic it doesn't evaporate and animals don't come and spoil it and you know uh, so there are certain boxes for animals also mm -hmm. you know so it's not that they are Locked. The other thing they have made is this whole, you know, almost thousand children die because of um, diarrhea in and around in villages, you know, and there is water shortage. So how do you wash hands, etc. So this very simple contrast is called the tippy tap. I mean, it's there on the net, yeah. And it's such a brilliant thing. It looks there in all the schools. Yeah, you know, it's a in 30 rupees. You know, half the deaths are, you know, plus it's a self-governed system. So children learn how to do it. Then they teach their parents, and then it goes through the to the villages. So that's some of the answer to the water thing. Yeah, I was, I was listening. The stories are interesting. The true stories are in fact common. I mean, stories all over have a lot of commonality. I mean, you see, take Indian examples, and then get that discussions are coming. There are some. Uh,
know, tinker around the system. That's what we see, you know, getting the conventions and doing the draft legislation and so on. The second set that we have seen are the alternative, little model alternatives from the Schumacher conceptual frameworks to, you know, all things. But then the movement discussion then takes it to a complete different level against the systemic. Uh, I mean, it's not just the cracks, it's replacing the system with a completely new model. What I want to say is whether all these little initiatives have a common story and a binding that can take this entire conference uh, to us. I just don't want this to be. I mean, it's a lot of. So, so I think, may, may I just. But I think the dots will connect backward. One, we need to be aware, sensitive enough to see where those dots are beginning to connect. And then what is it we can do to make that those connections even stronger and more widespread and more smart? Changing. See, I mean, what you are talking about is a question we had 20 years ago. We still have it. But it is changing. It is changing because some of those dots are beginning to connect. We are also getting out of our isolation and we are also trying in different ways to make that happen. So, so I don't think you need to be so pessimistic. No, 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 I was not. Knowing, I was asking exactly the answer. I am saying that it's actually it's good for it to let it happen. If we try to engineer that also, there's a problem. So, you're right, it's, that's what has happened. People like us have thought it, we, are, we are there, and we are doing it. But, but I think the process should happen. These kind of things must happen. And it will happen. Happen. Can I also just quickly announce that uh, one of the things we are trying to do is to bring people together like this, but on a regional uh, basis within India at the moment, in South Asia at some point, uh, called region, uh, Alternatives Confluences or Vikalp Sangam. You know, the whole idea of Sangam is something that's been a very ancient uh, idea. So, this is something on it. Please pick up copies, I'll give you more. And we are also tomorrow launching a website which will have a lot of these stories. If the stories, a number of them are not there yet, please bring them in. Uh, just to have one place where we can actually go whenever we are feeling depressed, go to that website and get inspired by the really incredible stuff that's happening out there. Morning.